Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Live from Las Vegas, it's time for you to be Talking Movies with America's most award-winning film critic, John Barber. You're being, John, you're being so gentle. I've heard you give reviews and you're so rough, you're saying. <laughs> How would you have evaluated your own work uh, in some of the films that you did prior to, uh, <laughs> prior to The Longest Shot? I mean, Much like better than you, my friend. <laughs> Our next guest is one of those rare talents who has something to say and can say it funny. He's a writer-performer on the new Laugh-In and one of the most popular, outspoken, and entertaining personalities on the local news here in Los Angeles. He's won a half a dozen Emmys as a film critic and host of his own shows. Let's welcome Mr. John Barber, right over there. Hi, this is John Barber, and welcome again to Talking Movies. And I've been waiting a long, long time to be able to talk to this very, very accomplished actor. He's been in over 155 movies and television shows, but as you'll find out very shortly, he's much more than an actor. Doug, how are you today uh, in Texas? I am going a little bit crazy, <laughs> given the move into this new location. Uh, everything you can imagine that could possibly wrong, be wrong with the home is going wrong and more. Oh, oh my God, it's exciting times. <laughs> is it the Peter Principle? Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm in Vegas, as you know. It's getting to be over 100 degrees here, so it's absolutely and totally brutal. But I love to start the show, honest to God, every time we do this show, listening to your magnificent voice and i'm sure everybody tells you you have a wonderful speaking voice right oh you're too kind i actually do hear that quite a bit which always amazes me well it shouldn't amaze me you kind of amaze it because it's true and i love voices and i was raised on them as a kid especially the good ones when i was a kid in canada i used to listen to lauren green remember who lauren green was i actually do Yes, he became, uh, uh, I think, Ben Cartwright on Bonanza. Right. But as a kid, I used to tell him, at least to listen to him on the radio, tell stories. And I guess the greatest voice in movies would probably have to be Orson Welles, right? Boy, he's right up there. That's for sure. Yes. Yes, he was. But, you know, when I, I think it was the second to last year I was a critic at NBC, I heard the voice of our guest, and it was only his voice, and it was absolutely fabulous, and it was really smart. I think it was in a horror movie called Black Christmas, and he was the sinister voice on the phone, and it was like the movie Jaws, you know, you never saw the shark, you just saw the people disappearing, so it's scary. So whenever the phone rang and you heard my guest's voice, chills ran up and down your spine. So right now, you're going to get to the, meet the owner of that voice, magnificent writer, and more than just um, a writer, he is a writer of poetry, actually. And he's more than an actor. He's also an activist. And I would like to welcome, after all this time, Nick Mancuso. Nick, how are you and where are you? Well, thank you very much. I think you can see the Eiffel Tower there. Can you see it? Oh, my God, I can, I can. We got one of these in Las Vegas, by the way, <laughs> on the top of a hotel. There it is. This so, is the real Eiffel Tower, and I'm in Paris right now. Okay, listen. And I'm actually sitting not far from a bench where Orson Welles sat uh, on his last movie, The Other Side of the Wind. Oh, my goodness gracious. You know, the great Orson Welles. He was indeed the greatest voice and probably one of the greatest 
actor directors in the history of film. Yes, and, I, uh, it's a wonderful I, man. I used I used to actually see him years ago when I was in uh, Los Angeles at a place yeah. called Ma Maison. Oh yes, a restaurant. Um, Listen, yeah, he had were, a table there. And yes, he would sit were, there all day holding you, court. <laughs> well, and I was too shy to go up to him and and, and talk to him. I just looked at this great great spirit. Man yeah. that uh, really, to me, represented what real Hollywood and the movies and everything else was really about. Then and, after, uh, after his first fantastic film, they decided to, to cut the legs out from under him. But you were, Nick, you were a very, very successful actor in Canada, a very successful actor in the United States. Why did you pick Paris to live in? Well, I've always loved France. Um, I worked here many, many years ago. Uh, I did. Uh, I worked with people like Catherine Deneuve and and some of the great uh, French uh, directors, uh, Yves Boisset and uh, Elie Chiraki. Um, I did my first French film in uh, Montreal years ago with a director by the name of Gilles Carl. It was called Maria Chapdelaine. It's a Quebecois classic, and through that. I entered the sort of French, uh, you might say the world of France. To me, France has always been, and particularly Paris, the center of art in so many ways. And, okay. uh, and, it's, always, and it's always been a, a kind of a womb for artists throughout history and throughout time. Of course, Orson Welles was here, but so many people have been here, Ernest Hemingway and you know, Gertrude Stein, and the great American writers and well, you described, you described it exactly as a poet would, would, as sort of a womb, you know. I've lived, uh, I lived in Los Angeles for about 35 years. I'm now living in Las Vegas. I've been here for about 20 years. A lot of people ask me what brought me to Las Vegas. And I say Los Angeles, because right now, Nick, I wouldn't go back there for free money. So I, I thought when I asked you what brought you to Paris, I would have thought you would have said the United States. In any event, tell us, if we were making a movie of your life, tell us where you were born, what your parents were like, what your youthful ambitions would, uh, were like, and then please, your given name almost sounds like music in Italian. So what was your given name? My name, my original name, is Nicodemo Antonio Massimo Mancuso. Oh, doesn't that sound like music to you? So, <laughs> okay. So, Nick, tell me uh, about your, uh, if we're making a movie about your life. So where does it start? And tell us about it, what your parents were like. Did you have siblings? And when did you go from Italy to Canada? And why? Well, I was born in 1948 in a small town in the south of Italy, uh, in the Aspromonte region of the area of Italy known as Calabria, which is in the deep south. It's just before you get to Sicily. And, um, and it was a beautiful little town. It's still there. It's a town named Mamola. And this is back right after the war. And um, my father, as many of my relatives uh, did at that time, left, uh, left Italy and migrated because, uh, you know, the war had been absolutely devastating. So many people died and there was a great deal of poverty and suffering at the time. So uh, everybody left, everybody migrated and they went to America and South America, Australia, New Zealand, all over Europe. There were well over 22,000 people in my town, and now there's less than 1,500. Why did they pick Canada instead of the United States? Well, Brooklyn was already filled up. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So you yeah. ended up in, did you end up in Toronto? Well, Toronto was, you know, Toronto is probably where we migrated to, is probably the largest city uh, outside of uh, Italy, uh, most of the migrants after the war, I don't know if you can see the tower, yeah, there it is. I see it. Most of the immigrants after the war uh, left uh, to for Toronto. Toronto has got almost a million and a half, uh, mostly Calabrians now. 
And uh, of course, it was, uh, you know, there was work, and that's why they, that's why we migrated. That's why my father left, and what that's why of, everybody left in order to survive. What kind? I had of relatives go to South America, to Buenos Aires, to Australia. Uh, to Luxembourg, to France, to uh, all over the world. What kind of so work? To, what kind of work did your father do? My father was a carpenter, and my grandfather was a carpenter. And I, I come from a long line of craftsmen. You probably arrived in Toronto in the mid fifties. I, I arrived in Toronto about nineteen fifty four. I think it was fifty three, fifty four. Well, I was. Yeah, I, uh, I was living there in the same time, and I think, yeah, and I think when you started to go to school at the University of Toronto, that's when I was running away to Hollywood illegally and the United States. So and when you were a young man, what, what, so you're in Canada. Did you have any interest in becoming a hockey player? <laughs> I mean, right now, I mean, that, that was my first game. Uh, right now, they're none, playing. None they're, whatsoever. Okay. So, uh, none well, whatsoever. Uh, I, hate, I hated hockey. Ah. I, I, I despised hockey. Oh, my God. I played God. hockey. I played hockey when I was a kid, you know, like we all did. And those ice ponds they used to have in Toronto. Yeah. In those days, they still had ice ponds, and I loved it. I, I had a lot of fun doing it. Oh, um, I, I, but I, I didn't like to watch it particularly. I liked playing it. Uh, but, you know, it's the kind of game that unless you have got strong ligaments, <laughs> you know, knees and joints, and uh, in those days, we didn't have helmets. So I remember, I think I was about 11 or so, when a friend of mine lost his teeth when a puck you know, hit him in the mouth. Well, that proves he's. And I think that was there. that was the last that was the last game I played. I thought, well, it's enough of that. Well, you know, when but, I was, when but I, it's a great game. It's a great game, and I have a lot of admiration for all the you know the players that can do it and all that. But you know, it got. I'll tell you one thing: I don't like about it. Never did like about it. Didn't like the violence of it. I always thought it was. Uh, you know, I mean. Yeah, you know, there was so much, you know, high sticking and, you know, and the whole thing. And it was just a, that's not what sports to me is about. It's not about, you know, knocking down the other guy and making sure he doesn't get up again, you know? Well, that's not when, what it's I, about. when I was that age at 11, all the money that I could beg, borrow, or steal, which was often, I'd get 50 cents and get on the streetcar and go down to Maple Leaf Garden. Sure, ma- oh. yeah, sure. Yeah, and you know. Yeah. Standing room yeah. only and watch the hockey games. I yeah. loved it. when I got to Hollywood and became successful, I started along with Bo Swenson, an actor you might have heard of. We started, oh sure sure we started the celebrity hockey team. So it oh, been, oh oh did you what yeah. what did what brought you to Hollywood? What were you doing there? Well, uh, I originally went to the United States to become at seventeen to become a professional gambler, but uh, and I was really? very successful but it was totally unrewarding. And what kept me going as a kid was watching movies. And at the end, it said made in Hollywood. So I decided to pack it in and go to Hollywood. And that's why I went there. But get to get back to you. Well, did you go there to make movies or, or what? Why, well, well, I went there to uh, become an actor. Uh, oh, and I didn't know that. Well, yeah, a, fellow, yeah. a fellow thespian. Oh, my God. But I ended up having to do everything to survive like a lot of us have to do. Of course. Of course. I, I never wanted to act. I never wanted to, uh, well, hold to go it. to that's Hollywood. What I get to, they, What's that? I, that's what I want to get to. Uh, yeah, I never wanted to act. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, you I, I, I certainly didn't want to go to Hollywood. I, I, okay. I you know, my, my interests were uh, I was a nerd. I was into science, astronomy, physics, electronics. Uh, you know, I knew about Nikola Tesla way before the Tesla when I was 12 years old. And I was into universe. I was into science. I was into uh, you know uh, I wanted to invent stuff, and I did. And uh, you know, at 16, I studied electrical engineering. I I, I graduated in uh, behavioral psychology, research psychology. Uh, but that acting was at the was University some... of Toronto, right? You studied. Well, no, I went to the University of Toronto and the University of Guelph. And you studied psychology, I, right? I studied well. I studied research psychology, behavioral psychology, and I also studied 
uh, philosophy and, and, and science. And I, I studied all kinds of stuff. My interests were eclectic, to say the least. Well, then and, why, uh, why did you not become a, more of a writer? And suddenly, what made you... Very good question. It's a very good question, because I started writing when I was 12, in, in Italian, actually, when we went back to Italy. I first started writing in Italian, and then uh, I continued writing, and I, uh, writing has been a secret passion of mine since I was a kid. I've been writing for years. Now, I only recently uh, started publishing stuff. I wrote, uh, you know, books of poetry, and I wrote two books, which I'm hoping to publish, and and uh, and I've written screenplays, and I've written plays. One of my plays is being done in at the National Theater in Romania right now, at uh, in Timisoara. Your book uh, and of poetry is called Mediterranean Man. What one one of them, yeah. The original title of that book was called Oedipus L.A. Oh, and it was wow. it was a remaking or a refurbishing of the old Greek myths of Oedipus and Ulysses and um, uh, and Alexander the Great and all sorts of old I Mediterranean stories. I, I I'm really kind of sorry that you're outside and not in the studio because. It, I hate to, I feel like I'm interrupting you and I don't want to interrupt you, but I, and I also hate to say this, that becoming an actor sort of demeans your intellect. Isn't that a terrible <laughs> thing to say? I mean, because you're an enormously well-read, intelligent human being, for God's sake, and you become an actor where somebody else writes your words. So why did you become an actor? And where did you start to first perform? Well, here's the honest truth. Um, like I said, uh, I was interested in primarily in science, and oh, and I liked baseball too. That was the one sport I did, I did uh, follow and uh, played. Um, but primarily, I was interested in science. What happened to me was that um, we went back to Italy uh, when I was 12 years old. Uh, my mother didn't like Canada, uh, Toronto, and. Uh, wanted to come back. So we went back for two years. And while I was there, I had an uncle, uh, my uncle Giovanni, my uncle John, who was a professor of Italian and uh, a sculptor uh, and, a, and a painter and artist. And, uh, and my mother put, him on, uh, put me under his wing to teach me uh, Italian because the language I spoke and still speak it is not Italian. It's a Sicilo Calabrian. It's a little bit like the difference between the Irish and the English. We had our own language and Italian was taught in schools. So I, I couldn't speak Italian. So my uncle, who was a professor of languages, uh, started to teach me Italian. And in the process of doing that, he introduced me to poetry. Uh, which I knew nothing about, the Italian poets. And, uh, and it just opened my eyes. He then uh, had me write as part of my uh, uh, training, and he taught me Latin, and he even started to teach me Greek uh, and the history. And, uh, and in a short period of time, he had opened my eyes to a whole new world. And uh, so I began to write and uh, I got published in, in Italian when I was 12. And, um, and I, loved, I loved writing, but really what I wanted to do was I wanted to compose. I, I liked music and um, I did play the violin for a while and, you know, and all that. But um, when we went back to Canada, um, which was a shock, you know, uh, for me, I, uh, I was very unhappy and, uh, very unhappy. Didn't want to be there at all. You know, I was not a hockey player. I was not into the, uh, ethos you might say of, uh, uh, of, uh, you know, the, the, what the, what the other kids were doing. And, uh, I was into other stuff. And, uh, at, as I said, at, at nine, and 10, I was, re <laughs> it sounds so arrogant, but it's the truth. It's what I did. When I was 10, I was reading Einstein. At 12, I started to study Tesla. And uh, I used to have a photographic memory. 
Uh, and I was a smart cookie. My IQ was quite high in those days. Um, and um, so the thing with acting was that I, I, was, I just hated high school. <laughs> hated it. And I hated being in school. And uh, probably would have uh, been one of those, I would have dropped out, except, you know, my father was a very, very, uh, he was a disciplinarian. And um, so I stayed. And of course, in those days, you, you didn't just drop out. And um, so I stayed and, uh, and I well, had a not teacher. Only, hold it. Not only did you stay in high school, you stayed in the university. What? Yes, yes. I went, I went through uh, all of that. Yes. But what happened was in high school, there was a teacher by the name of Gustav von Bierson Tripp. Gustav was a, an extraordinary man. He was a wonderful teacher. And he used to have these quizzes, uh, memory quizzes. Who could memorize something the fastest? And myself and Tom Agnew, who did become a, a physicist, I believe, used to have the top scores in memory. So he'd give us 15 minutes and he'd give us 10, 10 minutes. And one time he gave us five minutes to memorize a poem. So he looked at me and he said, Nick, you know it, don't you? And I said, yes. He said, stand up and recite it. I was terrified. I was a skinny kid with glasses, very, very shy. I had never spoken uh, in front of other kids. I was just, and I was just absolutely shut down. You know, I, I was not an extrovert in the least. Um, I was a bookworm. And um, so I stood up very nervously and I began to recite the poem. And Gustav, <laughs> uh, he uh, clapped his hands together, rubbed them furiously. And he looked at me and he said, you're joining the drama club. And I oh, said, it was what's somebody else's choice. I said, I said, what's drama? I didn't even know what drama was. Well, you had to because you obviously read a lot of Shakespeare along the way. Well, he introduced me to Shakespeare. Oh. He introduced me to Shakespeare. Because I know and, you ended up at Stratford for a couple <laughs> of years. And, and he had me, uh, we were doing Hamlet. So he put me in Hamlet, made me assistant director. And I played in my first part as Laertes. Oh, my and, God. And when I discovered Hamlet and Shakespeare, I was blown away. Oh, no I was wonder. So, I was so completely mesmerized by... Because you got to speak magnificent words. Oh, it's beyond that. Shakespeare was, is God's gift to, to mankind, God's gift to actors. So... Not only did I uh, memorize my part, but I memorized all the parts. And then I got a recording by Sir John Gilgud. Gilgud was one of the great British actors at that time. Uh, of Hamlet that he did in 1936. And uh, it was in those old record players, you know? Yes. And I, I hooked up the record player to a little earphone and a transistor and a capacitor and uh, and I managed to make a little earphone so the and put it on repeat so I could listen to it while I slept. And while I slept, I heard, Oh, who's there, Bernardo? Nay, tis a cold and bitter night, and I am sick at heart. And therein began Hamlet. Oh. And I was transported to another world. Well, you know, you and, and I... Uh, excuse me, but you and I have a lot of in common. I, too, hated high school, and I left it when I was 16 to come to the United States. And uh, I was also, for some weird reason, a lover of Shakespeare as a kid. And I could tell you, one, uh, one of the things that hooked me was listening to a story that John Gielgud told on the radio that had me as a kid in hysterics it would only take me a minute to tell you would you like to hear that story absolutely okay i'm a kid and i'm listening to this and he's talking about when it, it, he, he was uh playing uh hamlet and uh one night he and he always used to wear these tight tights and one night he lunged out toward the end of the play 
with his sword and his tights ripped, okay? Right. And so he was not wearing tight underwear, anything like that, as he said, but nothing happened. And the, the, the end of the show, the end of the play occurred to great applause. He said, but the next night, when they went on stage, the entire cast could not continue the performance because when one of the actors said to one of the other actors, it was a ghost scene. What, has that thing appeared again tonight? Yeah. Well, it was, well, I'm a kid and I'm hysteric. So what takes you, I can understand now why you became an actor, how did you, what were the first things that you did? I think the, you were in a theater group in Vancouver. Yeah. How no. did that lead to that magnificent voice in that spook movie I heard? <laughs> yeah. Um, what happened was, uh, I, uh, as I said, I was completely... Uh, uh, you know, really just uh, mesmerized by Shakespeare. And I began to read all of his plays, and then I began to record them uh, on those old tape recorders, playing the different parts, you know, for fun. But in the meantime, I continued uh, in my studies, and I, um, I was at the University of Toronto for a while, and then I, I dropped out. I had a crisis. I had a, uh, had a you know, I fell in love with this girl who rejected me, and my heart was broken, and I I left the school and I started wandering around writing poetry and I started to, uh, to drink and uh, be a poet and uh, didn't want to go back to school, but I decided I would go back and ended up the first year, the University of Guelph became a university. And in the university, I studied uh, science and psychology and so forth and so on, but they had a drama department. So I decided to take some, some drama and uh, I, would I did many plays in high school, besides Hamlet, a whole bunch every year. And then I started doing plays in, in, in the theater at the University of Guelph and, uh, and loved doing it. I just really started to enjoy it tremendously. I, I, I started doing the, the wonderful, the great playwrights, you know, and, uh, and they would all take me to this different world. And this was the 60s and there was this, revolution that was starting to happen you know this foment this spiritual change that occurred in the 60s now in music in painting and you know and the, the, politically and the thought and everything else and the theater was very very ebullient during that period of time so i ended up uh, doing a, a lot a lot of plays and but continuing in my studies and uh, in one of the plays uh, I did, uh, the head of the National Theater School saw me, and I was offered a scholarship to go to the National Theater in Ottawa. But I turned it down because I didn't want to be a professional actor uh, in the least. It was just for kicks. And then I graduated, and uh, this is around, I guess, 1966, uh, 66 or so, 67. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't, certainly didn't want to work as a psychologist. And uh, I, uh, at that time, this was the, the year that, um, the time that uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau uh, passed these, um, these bills, they were known as the Lip Grants, where they were going to put money up uh, for the arts in Canada. They were called the Lip Grants. So people started applying and they would uh, get money and they started building these little theaters in Toronto. And uh, one day I was uh, actually on my way to Osgoode Hall. I, I decided to become a lawyer. And I was uh, walking on my way there when I bumped into a dear friend of mine who had actually played Hamlet in high school, Geza Kovacs, God rest his soul, he's passed on. And Geza said to me, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to go apply for law. And he, I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going for an audition. You want to come? And I thought, why not? Well, I went with him and I got the part. And I ended up in a theater company back in 1969 with him called Studio Lab Theater. 
and we did a show called Dionysus 69, which was audience participation theater. And I loved it. I loved the theater. And that began the journey of doing play after play uh, in well, Toronto. At this, at, at this point, Nick, you have to, you've decided you're going to become a professional actor. What was the no, I, I, I still hadn't decided that. No, I, it was just it was it was just for kicks. It was just fun. I ended up going to Montreal and working, Vancouver and working. And then I said, oh, well, the hell with this. I'm going back to university. I'm going to go get my doctorate. And uh, and I went back to to Guelph and it was Professor Mullen that I went to go see about coming back to school. And he said, you're not coming back to school. And I said, why not? He said, you're an actor. You need to do this work. So I went back out and I started, uh, like I said, doing all these plays during that period of time. And this is around 1971. I was offered uh, a little part in a film called Black Christmas, playing the voice of Billy. That's and I auditioned true. for Bob yeah. Clark and I did it by standing on my head. Hold it and, a second uh, now. You yeah. could not have done this unless you were in the guild and a professional, right? No, no. I, there, there were no guilds or anything in those days. You're it was kidding. not a union thing at all. Oh, my God. Least. Okay, but yeah. a, question, a quick question. What did your carpenter father think of the fact that his... Not son... much. <laughs> did you have siblings, brothers or sisters? Two brothers and two sisters. I'm the oldest. Uh, uh, you're the oldest? Yeah. And what do your two brothers and two sisters do? Well, one brother is uh, actually works in the business. He's a recording engineer and an editor. He's worked in it for many, many years. Another brother is a uh, car contractor, carpenter. Uh, one sister is a teacher and the other uh, worked, uh, worked as an esthetician. Well, all of them, including your father and your mother, must have certainly over time become enormously proud of the work that you did as an Well, actor. I mean, my father's, like I said, my father, I worked in my father, my father worked in a factory and I worked there in the summer. And, uh, and I remember, you no, know, my father certainly did not want me to become an actor. And, uh, uh, but when I did become an actor and I started getting successful in Canada and started, you know, uh, winning all these awards, I won uh, the Canadian Oscar, the genie and, you know, the papers were all writing about me and I was starting to star in motion pictures in Hollywood and all that. Well, he started getting proud. He started, you know, because the workers he worked with would come and they'd put up pictures of me, you know, from magazines and so forth. And my dad was quite proud of the fact that I had managed well, to pull this off. What I would like to know, since you were not in a, you didn't consider yourself a professional actor when you did that magnificent, scary voice in Black Christmas, you then ended up in Stratford for a couple of years where you must have been absolutely in heaven. Playing. Well, no, you see, what happened was none of the regional theaters, I was, I was part of a group of people known as the Underground Theater of Canada. And we were rebels, anarchists, and we rejected the establishment theater at the time, what we considered to be very staid, what was referred to as deadly theater. So we were trying to do original uh, stuff. And we did. Out of that group came some amazing people. Michael Ondaatje, George Walker, uh, uh, Carol Bolt, and Michael Hollingsworth. And, you know, some became uh, international, like, like Michael Ondaatje, who did The English Patient. And uh, some extraordinary writers and, and great talents were when in that group. When you were at Stratford, though, did some... so So I would audition uh, for... <laughs> <laughs> I would audition, but I couldn't get into any of the regional theaters, you see, uh, because, as, <laughs> oh, man. So I, I, um, I uh, let's put it this way. I, I was not a persona grata in, in, the, uh, in the regional theaters, uh, which were mostly what we refer to as deadly theater. Um, it was pretty bad stuff. It wasn't particularly high, you know, not very high quality. So the stuff that we did in Toronto went on to become quite internationally known and the people went on to become uh, very well known. Des Mackinoff ended up on Broadway directing uh, big Broadway shows. Uh, you know, uh, he recently did Jersey Boys and many, many other shows. Well, this, uh, very... Nick, Nick, this brings me to the fact that uh, 
as an excellent actor against your will, okay? Did an agent approach you? Because all of a sudden... No, what happened was... No, what happened... <laughs> what happened was uh, Robin, <laughs> Robin Phillips uh, <laughs> took over Stratford. And Robin right. Phillips uh, was from England, and he was the going to take over the National Theater uh, at that time. Uh, by Olivier had offered it to him. He decided instead to come to Stratford, and he brought uh, great actors with him, Maggie Smith and Hume Cronin, Jessica Tandy, Jeremy Brett, Keith Baxter, and so forth. And he held auditions in Toronto. And I auditioned, and I got into the company. And because of Robin... I started to do Shakespeare at Stratford, which I absolutely adored. And I loved uh, working with Robin. God bless his soul. God rest his soul. And uh, while I was there, what happened was um, the head of casting at Universal Studios. Oh, I, I'd gotten, well, here, I'd gotten some brilliant reviews in the New York Times. And uh, I had gotten some horrendous reviews from the Toronto papers who referred to me as a refugee from The Godfather. Oh, wow. uh, but Walter Kerr of the New York Times uh, had come up, uh, and he was the premier uh, English critic, critic uh, for the English-speaking countries. In fact, there's a theater named after him in, in New York. Walter Kerr came up and reviewed Maggie Smith, Hume Cronin, Jessica Tandy, all these great actors, and this unknown actor by the name of Nick Mancuso gave me two paragraphs on this performance I did as Bassanio in Merchant of Venice, stating that I effectively, my performance, had eliminated the curse that had been put on that role for over 250 years. Wow. And because of that, the head of casting at Universal came up uh, and took me out for lunch and said, we would like you to come down to the States. And I said, no, thank you. And she said, why not? I said, I'm against the war in Vietnam because I, I was against the war. And she said, well, dear, if you ever change your mind, now because of Eleanor K K uh, Kilgallen, and she was the sister of Dorothy Kilgallen, the famous columnist, I was suddenly out of the blue, got a contract from uh, ABC. And they wanted to pay me a lot of money uh, not to sign with NBC or CBS. And I said, what do I have to do? They said, nothing, just don't sign. And they gave me a whole chunk of money. And they brought me out to Hollywood to meet with Aaron Spelling and Stephen J. Cannell. And uh, I was offered uh, a part by Stephen Cannell, who at that time was the top television producer in uh, Hollywood. You know, he did a Beretta, Rockford Files, 18, Greatest American Hero, you know, all the great. Uh, things and I, I, um, and I ended up uh, inadvertently uh, exercising my option. Uh, but that is to say, uh, once I went out there to meet them, and since I had told my agent I liked Steve Cannell, I now had to work with Steve Cannell. But I wanted to go back to Canada to do Loveborg in Strindberg in uh, Hedda Gabler because I was an actor. <laughs> and uh, so I couldn't, uh, I couldn't. <laughs> well, I could, listen, I, listen, I thought, I thought, Nick, you went from Stratford. I wanted to know how you ended up working with Tennessee Williams. Well, as I say, once I got out there, uh, I was, um, I, I, I had, and inadvertently exercised my option. I was brought to Steve's uh, office to, to do this pilot, a thing called Shack, which years later became Stingray. And, and Steve said, you know, what'd you think of the script? I said, it sucks. <laughs> and uh, he, he looked at me and, uh, and said, you know what? You're right. It does suck. Were you aware of the t at the time that Stephen was dyslexic? Do you know that he was the most successful writer producer in Hollywood was dyslexic? Totally aware of it. Oh, good. Because uh, we were. Friends. I didn't know it at that time, but here's what happened. Oh, okay. Steve being the man he was, he was a great soul rather than throw me out of that office. <laughs> 
said to me, you're absolutely right. It does suck. Come and write it with me. So I did. Oh, my God. And we worked, and we worked together for three weeks and created this character that years later became a Stingray. It was called Shaq. And it was during that period of time that I got to know Steve and I was introduced to Hollywood. And I began the journey, you know, up the ladder or up the ranks of, you know, like Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp also started with uh, with Steve Cannell with 21 Jump Street because that was his show. And uh, many people started with Steve and uh, including Kevin Spacey and all kinds of people. And um so I began my career there. And while I was there, I guess it was 19, and by this point, it was 1979. And I'd already done. Uh, I thought it was night, around 1985, Stingray, because I remember you well. No, I, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Tennessee Williams. Oh, so okay. what happened was I, I was I was um, I, I was working in Hollywood. By that point, I'd done a bunch of stuff. And I, I did. Uh, uh, I starred my first motion picture for Columbia picture called Nightwing and um, that uh, Arthur Hiller directed who was a Canadian and Marty Ransoff produced and so suddenly I was on, on the top of the heap and uh, of course the, the film is a huge flop but but during that period of time I started getting known in Canada and so forth and one day I got a call uh, this is about Tennessee Williams uh, from uh, a fellow by the name of Harry Rasky. Harry was a um, documentary filmmaker who had done an Oscar winning documentary on Tennessee Williams and somehow had convinced uh, Tennessee that the problem with uh, his plays because uh, Williams success his uh, uh, had failed after 1972 73 with uh, outcry and so forth was because he needed to have a real red-blooded he-man like himself to direct his plays Williams bought into this and decided to do a play that was a readaptation of 27 Wagons of Cotton Baby Doll and a short story that Williams wrote called An Unsatisfactory Supper. And that was turned into a play called Tiger Tail. And I got a call from uh, Harry offering me the part. And there I was in New York about to work with Tennessee Williams, which was like to me, he was a god, and I was so utterly nervous about meeting him that uh, <laughs> that uh, upon I was supposed to go up to 56th Street somewhere anyway to meet him at the Elysee Hotel. You know, Williams, of course, was a legend. Williams started off the career of Marlon Brando with a streetcar named Desire had worked with some of the greatest actors in Hollywood, Paul Newman and, you know, I mean, all the greats. Williams was one of the, was really in many ways the checkoff of our time. And I knew who he was and I was so nervous about meeting him that uh, when the cab got caught, actually it was in the 50s, I had to go up to the 70s. I jumped out of the cab so I wouldn't be late and I ran for uh, 20 blocks. And, uh, and I arrived... Uh, for this lunch, and there was Tennessee Williams surrounded by a whole coterie of New York's finest. This was the time of Andy Warhol and all that stuff. And I was this, you know, skinny, nervous kid. And uh, he looked up, took a look at me and said, this here is a great actor. His name is Nick Mancuso. And I was floored. I thought, my God, Tennessee Williams said I was a great actor. <laughs> what, what had happened was Walter Kerr had said I was a great actor and the word had gone around New York that there was this new kid on the block, i.e. me, who was supposedly a great actor. And uh, so I was I was floored. And, and he said, yeah, he said, uh, he said, have a seat. And I sat down with all these people. And, you know, these are a high highfalutin people and uh, very nervous. And uh just couldn't help put, putting my foot in my mouth because he says to me, he says, now you work with uh, the great actress Maggie Smith. And I said, I, I have. She's a great actress. I said, oh, she is. Of course, Maggie Smith was and is one of the great British actresses, you know. And, uh, and he said, and you work with uh, Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy. And I said, yes, great actress. Jessica Tandy played the original Blanche Dubois in uh, Streetcar Named Desire. 
and uh, you work with so forth and so on. And, and I said, yes, great actors. And I said, indeed, great, great actors. And then he said, and you work with my close friend, Keith Baxter. And I said, yes, I did. Great actor. And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> and he said, what? I said, well, I, 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 I don't think Keith Baxter is a great actor. I, I thought to myself, why would I lie to the greatest dramatist in the modern times? Surely he must know that Keith Baxter is not a great actor. Little did I realize that he was a very close friend of Tennessee Williams. Uh-oh. Countess Sohn was sitting next to me, turned to me and said, well, you know, he's a very dear friend of mine. <laughs> and I said, well, he may be a friend of yours, but, you know, I don't think he's a great actor. Well, Williams shut down, wouldn't talk to me, wouldn't even look at me for the rest of the lunch. When I got up to shake his hand after lunch, he walked away from me in a huff. I went back to the village and the phone rang and it was my agent. He said, what the hell did you do? Tennessee Williams wants to fire you. And I thought, I don't know. What did I do? And I thought, oh, maybe it was that comment about Keith Baxter. <laughs> I, I, anyway, he didn't fire me. So we go off to Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, we start rehearsing. And Tennessee Williams is there every day with his hat on, dark sunglasses. But in Atlanta, words. in Atlanta, it wasn't the play The Night of the Iguana? No. The first play was Tiger Tail. The oh. next play was Night of the Iguana. Oh, okay. So while I was rehearsing uh, this play, Tennessee Williams, uh, you know, wouldn't look at me, wouldn't even, you know, because he was so pissed off with me for what I had said. And uh, in his dark sunglasses. And finally, one day, uh, and I noticed that Harry didn't know how to direct theater. And I already done 10 years of theater, 12 years of theater. He didn't know how to block. So I began to block the play. There were off-Broadway actors and other actors, so we began to block, and one day Williams calls me over and says, Nick, come over here. Come over here, very angrily. And he says, takes the script and he says, now here, right here, I want Silvio, character I was playing, to say to him, on the bio. And I went, okay. I wrote down on the bio. And here, I want him to say, and I wrote down what he wanted to say, and right here, I want Silvio who was a Sicilian American, to look up into the sky and to shake his fist and to say, Dio, oh, Dio, which means God, oh, God. And I said, I don't think so. And he said, what? <laughs> well, I said, well, uh, Silvio is a Sicilian. He's not a Roman. A Sicilian would not shake his fist and say, Dio, Dio. A Roman would. So Williams looked at me and he said, well, say something in Italian. And I said, like what? Spaghetti? <laughs> so he broke out laughing. <laughs> and he grabbed my hand. And we were friends from that moment onwards. He was one of the finest gentlemen I have ever worked with. And I will go to my grave uh, with the memory of the great Tennessee Williams, standing on stage with him, opening night to a standing ovation. Uh, that was before I went off to Hollywood. Now, uh, in Hollywood, okay, Hollywood. Uh, I just want to interject here something uh, about how old were you at the time? And I, w I was, were, uh, and and were you married at the time? Um, I was married. I was married uh, to my first wife. Uh, uh, well, hold it. You said first. You mean you're going to count them for us? Oh, I've been married four times. Oh, my goodness gracious. Yeah. How, wh how and why? Well, uh, you'd have to ask God that. I can't answer it. Uh, okay. And are you currently married? I am currently married, yes. You have yes. any children? I have one son uh, who is now 22. And what does your son do? Is he going to school? He was studying art. He's, he's a natural artist. Oh, wonderful. So he's inherited some of your genes and knowing you. you or, or my grandfather's, yeah. Okay, okay. So now you were with Shakespeare at Stratford, Tennessee Williams in Atlanta. Now you go to Hollywood and you do two very successful multi-million dollar movies called Under Siege. How did that happen? And what was it like now working on those scripts 
and with actors like Steven Seagal and uh, Tommy Lee Jones and Gary Busey. What was it like working in Hollywood now with scripts that aren't Tennessee Williams? Well, you know, I hate it. I really did hate it, most of it. You know, I, I couldn't really, uh, you know, I was great. I mean, I enjoyed the work, but, but I, I didn't like Hollywood. You know, I, I didn't like uh, the red carpet. I didn't like all that over here, over here. I didn't like celebrity. I didn't like any of that. I'm not made for that. I just wanted to act. I liked playing parts. I like uh, transforming into the stuff, but I wanted to play parts that were interesting, you understand? I mean, there's a far cry uh, if you're doing Ibsen or you're doing Anouille or you're doing Shakespeare, you're doing Moliere or you're doing uh, Goldoni and you're doing Aeschylus or, or uh, you know, uh, Pinter. It's, it's a totally different experience, you, you understand? Absolutely. As opposed, to doing, as opposed to doing, you know, cop number three and, you know, freeze, you know, I said, freeze, put your gun down, you know, over, you know, and, you know, the usual. But uh, uh, under but I, I, have, I, have, I have certain rules, you see. Under well, yeah. Well, one of the rules I have about acting is never play a character, uh, play uh, named Rocco. <laughs> never appear, never appear uh, in a movie okay, where, the, where the word chopper is repeated more than three times. Can you hear me? I can, can yes. Uh, okay. Under siege, you met Steven Seagal. Yes, with... yes. I worked with Steve three times. Okay. And, now, uh, previously, hang on a minute. Previously, yeah. you mentioned the disruption, the horrible disruption and protests and disintegration of the United States uh, that led to the Vietnam War and the, the assassinations and everything that was going yes. wrong in this country. Yes. And Steven Seagal subsequently moved to the Soviet Union. When you met Steven, was there any hint of him when you talked to him, if you did talk to him, about his growing uh, dissatisfaction with what was happening to America? Well, I mean, uh, I think uh, certainly when I met Steve, uh, I... Uh, you know, I, I only played a very small role in Under Siege, but but I got to know him. We became friends, and uh, he's a very interesting man. You know, he, uh, at the age of seventeen, uh, you know, encountered the founder of Aikido, uh, Ueshiba Sensei Morai. Now, here's the thing about Aikido. I also studied Aikido, and I know what it means, but but. You see, Uishiba Sensei Morai was, of course, the great Japanese master and founder, uh, was a deeply spiritual, highly evolved soul. It wasn't about uh, beating the other guy up. No, no, no. Aikido means the transformation of the self. I, transformation, key, is life force. Do means the path of the transformation of the life force. So, so... Steve, as a kid, was mesmerized when he saw Ueshiba Sensei Morai at the age of 85 fight off 20, you know, uh, 10 or 7 or 8 20-year-olds without touching them to fly through the air. You can see it online sometime. And, uh, and he ended up going to Japan to study. And I don't know if he actually studied with Ueshiba. But he did study maybe, uh, I think, uh, he, 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 Ushiba was still alive at the time. But he was one of the truly, truly extraordinary spirits. And he got into it. The thing about Aikido, and I studied, like I said, not to, to, that he did. The discipline that is necessary uh, to do this kind of work is uncanny, uncanny. I studied for six years. He studied for 25 and or 30, about his whole life now. It's almost 50 years of study. And, uh, and he was changed, transformed. If you can really do Aikido, you can do anything. I mean, almost anything. So, but, you know, if you actually follow the study of it, you know, it is not only tremendous discipline, but if you really follow it, it's a, vow of poverty uh there is a it's it's you know I, I don't know how he did it but he did you know 
So the strangest thing in destiny, I think it was all a question of destiny, occurred when, when he, by, by a fluke, um, his producer, the, the guy that became his producer, a fellow by the name of Julius Nasa, happened to go to Japan on business and hired Steve, and he was a distant relative of Steve, hired Steve to be his translator because Steve speaks fluent Japanese. He was already married to a Japanese woman and, uh, and bodyguard and got the idea that he might be able to actually be in the movies. This was after, you know, Bruce Lee was gone and there was, I think, only Chuck Norris. And, right. and, uh, and, and the two of them together came up with what then became uh, above, uh, above the law. Uh, and they managed to somehow hook up with Mike Ovitz, who was the head of CAA, the most powerful agency in Hollywood, and uh, got some screenwriters in there, and th that became a huge hit. You know, it was made for, you know, I think $8 million and ended up making $500 million or whatever, and suddenly, boom, Steve goes from being monastic, you know, monastic, you know, to, boom, superstar. How does, he go from, how does he go from spiritually handling a vow of poverty to exactly. becoming, good, good becoming, question. becoming exactly. a millionaire? Exactly. Very, very difficult, you know. So I think, I think I mean, I can't speak on his behalf. He's a friend. But, uh, you know, he, he's, he's a man of conscience. And he is a man of, uh, who sees the truth. And, and fights for the truth. And his, his, his truth was that he could clearly see what was going on. Certainly Hollywood, you know, without getting into the Hollywood swamp, uh, the reality is there's some very, very good people in Hollywood. I've worked with them. Steve Cannell was one of them. There's some very fine people. But, you know, there's also some pretty nasty individuals there and, uh, and some very dark places. You don't need to read Hollywood Babylon and uh, you don't have to know the truth about uh, the experience of Hollywood, but a lot of horrible things have happened in Hollywood and continue to happen. And basically I think what occurred for Steve is that he just pissed off a lot of people because he would not kowtow basically to the system. You know, there's some actors are like that. I mean, I, I've always, I have that inside of me too. Mickey Rourke, you know, he walked away from it, you yes. know, because he couldn't deal with it. Great actors, some great, uh, you know, great people, uh, and and actresses uh, uh, Nick, have walked only, away. Not only did Stephen walk away from the country where he became a millionaire, he walked. He went to the Soviet Union. He is in the Soviet Union now, I guess. If he's still, he, I as far as I know, as far oh, as I know. Oh, because I was going to ask you if you've gotten a chance to speak to him and ask. Not, 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 not in a long time. Not in a long time. I can't speak on his behalf. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, as far as obviously what is going on in the world right now, uh, these are troubling times, to say the least. Oh, they're getting the worst. But the fascinating thing about you, you know, uh, Donald Jeffries, who's interviewed you a couple of times. He did, yeah, he, Donald's he, a great soul. He wrote he, a great book called On Borrowed Fame. Yes. Uh, and I, 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 did the I wrote a little bit on that. I did the forward to it, by the way. Yeah. He did the yeah. To my book, but he kept telling me, when you meet Nick, you will meet one of the very last Renaissance people on earth who ever, you know, went close to Hollywood. And indeed, I have. So it seems to me, Nick, that you have become this reluctant success. You know, it's like, you well, think, you know, I like I, I also paint and, and I write and, and and I and I do compose as well a little bit. But but um, yes, I guess you might say there is a kind of, uh, you know, to me, uh, the the soul of the artist is really what interests me. And, you know, the the beauty around us, you know, the this world. I, I'm in one of the most beautiful cities in the world right now. And um you know, I, look, beauty, uh, you know, is truth, as, as uh, Shelley wrote, uh, or was it Keats? Yeah, and truth, beauty. That is a fact. 
Where there is great ugliness, there is great deception and lies. And, you know, Hollywood has gone through cycles of great beauty and great ugliness, as America has. America has gone from the shining city on the hill, you know, to, to the swallow of, of the homeless situation of the last 35 years and the violence and the gun and, and, and the insanity and the poverty and, and so forth. It's absolutely despicable what has happened uh, to America. Because it really truly is a, was it was, uh, and hopefully will be again, a shining example. Because, uh, because I, doubt that, I doubt that will ever happen for one simple well, reason. I hate to bring it up. No, no, I, I don't necessarily disagree with you. Well, the reason I doubt it will ever happen is that America totally collapsed on November 22nd, 1963 with the murder of John Kennedy. I agree. I then, totally agree. Then there was the murder of uh, Robert and then the murder of... Absolutely. And Martin Luther King. Yes, absolutely. I agree with you. And then later, John Lennon. This is a country that kills the artists, kills the poets, kills the dreamers. Yes, yes. That's what it does. Of course. Of course. But I mean, civilization course. has done that since they nailed Jesus to a cross. Uh, but, absolutely. And the Greeks knew this. Yes, indeed. They, yes, indeed, they did. Well, Oh, no, absolutely. Okay, now, I saw... And those were my ancestors, by the way, because the south of Italy was known as Magna Graecia. It's where the oh. Greeks had migrated. Calabria was Calabrios, uh, Greek. So, so we, I, have that, I, have the, I have that in my blood, you might say. One of my, one of my personal heroes was John Cassavetes. Oh, and, my uh, God, I knew him well. John Cassidy. Did you really? I, I love yes, John. Yes. I, I wish I had met him. I worked with all of his actors. I worked with Ben Gazzara. I did not work with Gina Rollins. I worked with uh, John Marley. I worked with uh, um, uh, Seymour Cassells. Um, but I never worked with... Uh, oh, I, I knew Peter Falk, but I never worked with... Uh, I, I, was, I, I wish I had met him. You know, I, I know someone here in Paris who knew him very well, who worked on opening night. And he had such a tr profound wonderful influence you know in hollywood when hollywood was, was yeah because what you know, john would do he would do you know wonderful interesting movies like marvelous that. marvelous yeah. very baby and then take the money and go make his own films uh, absolutely a real artist oh my gosh yes yeah yes. yeah oh my gosh well so you I, knew him huh you knew oh, him yes, extremely extremely well oh my did goodness. you did you work with him in some capacity or what did no. you do uh, no, uh, and it's an interesting thing. My wife, who has a magnificent speaking voice, my wife has ne next to uh, 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 the the, uh, the wonderful actress who was Patricia Neal, had a magnificent Oh, voice. wonderful. Yes, yes. The Fountainhead. Yes, my yes. Wife, my wife has that kind of voice. My wife was a band singer for Earl Father Hines, but my wife oh, was... Wow is the most extremely private person I have ever met. She just loves getting up every morning with the birds and that was, that's it for her. That's a happy and full life. She's, oh my God, she's the only person I know, uh, Nick, who never envied anyone. And Isn't we were, lovely? you know, I was Sinatra's private writer for four and a half years. And- Oh uh, my God, you know, I wrote a play on Frank Sinatra. Oh, well, and then uh, uh, Red Fox was my mentor and my lifelong friend for years. Dean Martin wow. knew wow. them all. It's, uh, by the way, my book called Your Mother's Not a Virgin, The Bumpy Life yeah. of the Canadian Dropout Who Changed the Face of American Television, is the best book ever written about anybody in show business. And your friend and mine, Donald Jeffries, did the foreword. And there's a oh. Yes, and I would. Oh my God, you would just absolutely love reading it. I, I'd love to read it when you know I couldn't see for a while because I don't know if I I went through a whole uh, a health oh crisis, and but now it's back. My sight's my sight is back. Diabetic oh, and all that. Fantastic. But, uh, oh, you yeah. sent an address. I will send it to you. Unfortunately, it's too. I uh, too. It was too. Long. Seven hundred and fifty-two pages were too long for me to record, and I'd I'd be if I had a voice like you. 
I would have uh, recorded. I would love to record it. But oh my gosh, you will love the book. And oh, and what's it called? What's it called? This book? It's called Your Mother's Not a Virgin. All you have to do is go Google on Amazon. Everything is a five star. Yeah, but, yeah. I can get a I can get a friend of mine to get it for me off Amazon. I can uh, do that. Well, I would love to send you an autograph. No, no, no I, I'll, I'll get it right off because I can open the, the font. Oh, and, and my it, God, it? I would be so honored. That'd I mean, give me time because I'm in the middle of a, doing all kinds of stuff right now. But, okay, but uh, give me some first, time, but I'd like to read it. Tell me how much you, you would charge. I'd be happy to pay you. But the other thing is, <laughs> I know you've recently shot a movie that you're about to release and what is about? The, well, there's a film. I, I actually I had a film come out uh, recently, a comedy with Burt Young, actually called Road to the Lemon Grove. And it played uh, it played uh, in the theaters before the lockdown. But it uh, just played in Lincoln uh, Center, actually, in New York. It's a wonderful comedy, uh, Canadian. Uh, 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 and uh, and uh, uh, you wouldn't. Well, there was a uh, Rosella Brescia, uh, Burt Young. Uh, you wouldn't know uh, Charlie Chiarelli, who starred and, and wrote it with uh, Dale Hildebrand. Marvelous comedy, just old, wonderful comedy. That's available now. But the film that's coming out now is a picture I did called "The Performance" by a fellow by the name of Steve Wallace, a Canadian. It's a marvelous piece of writing that uh, uh, Peter O'Toole was supposed to do. Wow. Uh, playing the part of an old actor who goes to uh, the theater to give a performance, uh, a one night performance uh, about his life in the very theater that he started off when he was, you know, in his early 20s playing Hamlet. And, uh, and we shot that a number of years ago. Uh, it's a beautiful film, the performance. And, and what happened to it was it got caught in legal disputes and uh, and finally, it's been resolved, and hopefully, it will come out uh, this year. Um, um, I also, I also did a bunch of smaller pictures in the last little while. I did one on the life of Gregory Corso, which I co-write, co-wrote, the beat poet who was actually Calabrian, like myself. He was, uh, you know, uh, him and uh, and uh, uh, Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac, uh, basically, were the founders of the Beats. Absolutely. Uh, well, Nick, let me tell you something. It's been more than a joy to speak to somebody like you, because indeed you are, as Donald said, the last of the great Renaissance people in, <laughs> in Hollywood, in America, or even in, in the world. Uh, and I, hope, to say that. I hope we get a chance to do this again. Let's, uh, uh, let's try. Let's try and let's, uh, let's say goodbye. Uh, to uh, to the Grand Dame, the Eiffel Tower. Okay. She... Goodbye to you. Uh, goodbye to the Grand Dame. And oh my God, you are a treasure. Honest to God. And a God pleasure. bless you. God bless you all. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. And thank you all. And we'll see you again in two weeks with another Talking Movies.